talked about the basics of how endogenous and exogenous chemicals interact, let's talk about some specifics and specific examples of exogenous chemicals. And we'll start off really basic by quantifying them as uppers, downers, and all-rounders. But as you're going to see, it's a lot more complicated. And keep in mind, this is just an introductory course. We do have advanced courses on drugs and behavior if you, this is something that really interests you. When we talk about uppers, what we're really talking about is the types of drugs that amongst their many effects include the effect that excite us. They provide more activity in the brain through eliciting more activity in our excitatory neurotransmitters. They arouse our sympathetic nervous system and create us to reach heightened levels of alertness and arousal. Because of this, because all uppers have this effect, taking combinations of uppers can lead them to being agonists of each other where they will heighten that effect. And uppers and downers are antagonists of each other, meaning if you combine uppers and downers, you can cause really severe health outcomes. For instance, if you're taking a really potent upper like cocaine with a really potent downer like heroin, also known as a speedball, that can be life threatening. So don't do that. Uh, and so let's talk about various examples of what we mean when we're saying uppers. The first example we're going to talk about is the drugs associated with nicotine usage. So we think about nicotine, you might be thinking about cigarettes, you might be thinking about vaping or cigars or chewing tobacco or anything of that nature. The reason why nicotine is so uh, addictive is because it mimics the endogenous chemical acetylcholine. Amongst other things, nicotine and cigarette usage can elicit dopamine and pleasure, of course, in the brain, but it's really the acetylcholine that we want to call out in here. Acetylcholine is a chemical that helps us with our muscle movement, and if you are a regular smoker or regular vapor and you're experiencing withdrawal from smoking or vaping, what happens here is your body has started to deregulate the amount of acetylcholine it produces, and now when you are going without your morning cigarette, let's say, you start to get the jitters and you start to get the shakes. And that's because your body is experiencing a lower level of endogenous acetylcholine and you're starting to get this. Also, if you're a habitual smoker or vapor, you might find that your brain is a bit foggy before you have a puff. And after you do that, you might be able to focus and concentrate. And that's the idea that once your body is used to getting this exogenous chemical, it needs it to focus and be on the memory. And it's also the idea that it also helps you to feel less stressed. A lot of people will go have a cigarette when they're feeling very, very stressed out. Now keep in mind, if you're not a smoker, there's no evidence that smoking or vaping actually lowers your stress or provides you a super memory. It's only when you become addicted and you're a habitual user that it tends to have these effects. Now, of course, we should point out that at one point in our history, we believe that tobacco was a health additive and that as late as the 1970s, doctors were prescribing cigarettes, saying that they would calm people's nerves and that they would make them more focused. We have since disproven that. But it's important to remember that in many cultures around the world, especially indigenous North America cultures, tobacco has a spiritual and cultural uh, importance to them. Next up, we're going to talk about caffeine. Now, what might surprise you is caffeine is not actually an upper in a traditional sense. It actually doesn't make you feel more up or give you more energy. In fact, caffeine is actually uh, mimicking a receptor that will block adenosin. So it blocks the adenosin receptors. And what adenosin does is it's a neurotransmitter that allows you to feel tired. And so caffeine actually doesn't make you more awake. It blocks the chemical that allows you to know that you're tired. So this is why uh, some people, when they drink coffee, it actually puts them to sleep. I'm one of those people that when I have a cup of tea, I actually become more sleepy. It doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't actually make you more awake when you take coffee coffee late at night. All it does is it blocks the receptor that lets you know that you are sleepy. Next up, we'll talk about amphetamines. And so amphetamines come in lots of different varieties. And what is very common amongst all of them is they are very, very good at mimicking norepinephrine. Now, most of these will mimic other things. As mentioned, they'll mimic serotonin, they'll mimic, they'll mimic dopamine. Almost all recreational use psychoactive drugs will mimic dopamine to some extent. But what's especially important here about amphetamines is how they mimic norepinephrine. And that is because they make us feel more aroused. Norepinephrine is that physiological arousal neurotransmitter. So by providing a mimic for that, our brain gets flooded with a chemical that makes us feel very awake. And so amphetamines come in many varieties, such as prescription medicines, such as Adderall or Ritalin, commonly used for individuals who have ADHD. And this allows them to feel the proper level of stimulation to focus. 
Now, of course, Adderall and Ritalin are sometimes used recreationally and, and misabused recreationally as well. We also know things such as EpiPens. They release a huge surge in norepinephrine. It can also increase your anxiety level, of course. It makes your heart go very fast. Your breathing goes very shallow and very fast. And so this is the idea that it is giving you a super level of arousal to prevent you from going into a coma following an allergic reaction. And then there are types of amphetamines that are more commonly seen as street drugs. Things like methamphetamine, speed, crystal meth, bath salts, things of that nature that we don't tend to see associated with any uh, medicinal use, but we tend to see that are made in meth labs or made in drug users' homes, and they're used for a very strong and potent hit of this huge arousal. Now what's really interesting is for the last couple of years, the Calgary Police Service have, have commented on how, although other types of drugs may be more common in Calgary, the drugs associated with the most crime in Calgary are methamphetamines, so crystal meth in particular. And we find that when individuals are very high or inebriated on something like crystal meth or methamphetamines, they are very impulsive and they're very risk-taking. And they tend to do things that are very dangerous through dangerous driving, or they might do very uh, violent crimes or sexually violent crimes. Uh, we tend to find that the uses of meth is very much tied to aggressive and impulsive behavior. Moving on from amphetamines, we're now going to talk about uh, something that is very much also an upper, and that is the drugs that very much are tied to serotonin, such as ecstasy or MDMA or molly. And so with ecstasy, what's going on here uh, can best be explained by first understanding what's going on in SSRIs. So medicinally, we know there is a purpose towards having antidepressant drugs that help us to receive more serotonin in the brain. So drugs such as Paxil, Prozac, and Zoloft are SSRIs that help us to feel uh, more aroused in a more emotional sense. This is different than norepinephrine. You can get antidepressants that are selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, such as Wellbutrin, and that would fit more in our, in our amphetamine section. But SSRIs fit more in this section in that they allow for more serotonin to be in the brain. A lot of individuals experiencing anxiety and depression do not have enough serotonin in the brain. When you're experiencing depression, there's not enough of that excitatory serotonin that light up your brain, you feel more gloomy and down. When when you have generalized anxiety, you might not have enough of the inhibitory serotonin that can help shut down your panic. So both anxiety and depression can benefit from antidepressants, even though it, the name makes it sound like it's only good for depression. And what goes on here is it provides us with more serotonin. And so this allows the brain to light up, it can make us feel happy, it can make us feel alive. It can be risky if you overdose on these. You can get uh, you can get serotonin syndrome where you just your brain is too active, and what that might look like is when someone is very high on ecstasy. So ecstasy is a recreational drug that's often associated with electronic dance and raves and parties. And what ecstasy does is it's different from a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It actually produces what's called a serotonin dump. If you think about a prescription medicine releases a certain level of serotonin, ecstasy causes all of your brain cells to dump their serotonin all at once. This floods your system with the maximum level of serotonin you can possibly feel. And so serotonin, a lot of serotonin is associated with happiness and really elated feelings. Using ecstasy makes one feel this huge sense of euphoria, huge sense of feeling alive. They have a lot of energy. It makes their sensations on their skin feel very different, like their skin feels more intense. And when they touch things, sensation and perception might give them senses of synesthesia because there's so much activity in the brain. There might be cross links between different perceptual pathways but also they're so aroused their heart rate is going really fast they're breathing really shallow and they might also get really dehydrated and really thirsty now ecstasy is the type of drug that if you take it a few times it might cause flashbacks that you might get throughout your life because it has such an potent effect on you but it would definitely, although it definitely releases lots of things like norepinephrine and dopamine, what is really special about ecstasy here is how it does this really massive serotonin dump and the last one in our uppers category we're going to talk about is cocaine or crack or powder or blow or any of those uh, phenomena that come from the coca leaves. This is when I say coca leaves, I'm not meaning chocolate and I'm not meaning cocoa like from caffeine. The coca plant grows in Colombia and for a long time, indigenous South Americans would chew the leaves of the coca plant and would get the effects. That seems to be a less potent version than using the refined powder or the crystallization through a crack pipe. 
And what happens with crack or cocaine is there's lots of different things, but like all these uh, exogenous chemical examples, the endogenous chemical it mimics the strongest is dopamine. And out of all these possible recreational drug uses, the one that releases the most dopamine is cocaine. And what dopamine does, if you recall, is it acts on the pleasure center in our basal ganglia. And because cocaine, especially when snorted up through the nose, will act very directly on the basal ganglia, what is often happening here is it releases this huge sense of pleasure. It directly taps into the pleasure center of the brain and it taps it in such a way that it exceeds what our endogenous chemicals can do. That is, we can release dopamine through lots of natural ways, through a runner's high, through doing lots of pleasurable stuff, through having positive relationships in our life and doing exciting things, but cocaine, its exogenous use can exceed what we naturally could endogenously. It can get us to higher levels. This is what makes cocaine so addictive. This is what makes cocaine so uh, dangerous because you start getting these huge pleasurable highs that you can't get through other substances or through other activities in your life and you just want to use the cocaine again. Researchers have found that if they try and mimic this in rats through putting electrodes right into the rat's brain where pressing a lever or pressing a button in the rat's cage will make the electrode fire on the rat's basal ganglia, rats will choose to stand there and press the button or press the lever and not mate with other rats in their cage, not eat food, not drink water, not take naps. It's so pleasurable, that direct impact on their basal ganglia, that they will starve to death. They will just tap the lever until they die. And so cocaine is so addictive because when a user is habitually addicted to cocaine, they're essentially rats pressing the lever. They know that their next hit can give them that huge pleasure center and they are desperate for it. There are certainly ways to come off of cocaine, and we do have very functional addictive treatment methods for cocaine, but just be aware that this is what makes it a very particular type of exogenous chemical that has these major cautions associated with it.